Look, let's start with the government's political decision to break a firm election promise and scrap those stage three tax cuts. The Prime Minister, as we've been playing for you this afternoon, said this was a solemn promise. I can confirm that we haven't changed our position. We have no change to our plans. Tax cuts will happen in July. We haven't changed our position. I've said we haven't changed our position. We haven't changed our position on the stage three tax cuts. We have not changed our position on stage three tax cuts. They've been legislated. We support them. Our position hasn't changed. As early as this year, for goodness sakes. Now, the next election will tell whether the government's rewarded by lower income earners by this move or whether it's seen as hypocritical for breaking such a solemn oath. Now, we'll get to Cassandra Windsor, Chief Economist of the Committee for the Economic Development in Australia, shortly. But first, some stats from the tax office itself. Now, in 2021, the top 1% of taxpayers who earn more than $377,000 a year paid 18.3% of total income tax. The top 10% who earn more than $137,000 a year paid 46% of the tax, as you can see. Look here, the bottom 50% of taxpayers, they pay 11.6% of income tax. So let's drill down into this a little bit more, shall we? The tax office says there are 3.93 million people who earn $45,000 a year or less. Collectively, they pay $828 million in tax, but they claim $7.3 billion in tax back from the government. In other words, they receive around $6.5 billion more from the government than they pay in tax itself. They are not net taxpayers. Now take people who earn more than $148,000 a year, the top 10%, if you like. Well, the tax office says there are just over a million of them. Collectively, they pay $21.4 billion in tax each year, but they claim $4.2 billion in deductions. They pay net tax, net tax, of $17.2 billion. Now, tell me, who needs a tax cut right now? Those who pay tax already or those who collect more from the government than they pay? Who, by the way, have already had the lion's share of benefit from the first two stages of these tax cuts? Well, Cassandra Windsor is the Chief Economist of the Committee for Economic Development based in Perth and joins me now. Cassandra, many thanks. The scrapping of that 37 cents in the dollar tax bracket was seen to be the only genuine and progressive tax reform by the Morrison government. Is a good policy for the Albanese government to, uh, to leave it there now? So, look, the core feature and the reason a lot of economists have been calling for some revisions to these tax cuts is the economic environment that we're in, which is quite different from where we were a few years ago when these were first put in place. And we really need to take into account the inflationary aspects of these tax cuts and particularly when we know who's really struggling with cost of living pressures at the moment, which is not high income earners, um, we do think there is a real um, reason to shift um, the distribution of the tax cuts or potentially also the timing of them um, so that we're not adding to inflation, but we're also looking at how we can um, improve cost of living pressures on the households doing it toughest. OK, but how can it not add to inflation? If you've got low-income earners being given more of that money, they immediately are going to relieve their cost of living by spending the money, which is inflationary and is working against what the Reserve Bank is trying to do. This is a really core cool problem we've got at the moment, that the Reserve Bank is still really committed to getting inflation under control, as they should be, because inflation is the biggest driver of these cost of living pressures. And it does seem like the government and the RBA are not on the same page on some of this. So we do think, well, I think the um, proposed changes to the tax cuts are, are better than the um, original version. I think there is still scope to look at how inflationary they are and potentially delay them a little bit until we've got inflation under control. But isn't there also the situation that inflation has raised people's wages, so bracket creep has become more insidious and actually given the government more money? One of the reasons for the stage three tax cuts was argued to give people back their own money that they had lost due to inflation and due to bracket creep. So bracket creep is, um, is really a big problem and something that we'd like to see addressed, but through different measures. So probably more through some sort of uh, indexation, so it's more automatic, rather than waiting on decisions about when and where to cut taxes. I think this is part of a bigger conversation we need to be having around tax reform and the role of taxes. And when we look longer term, we do see that income earners um, 
wage earners are bearing the brunt of a lot of um, taxation and that gets worse and we get further out. But this needs to be part of a bigger conversation where we're looking at income taxes, we're looking at GST, we're looking at company taxes and how they all interact with each other. But one of the things that I go back to my original question was taking away that 37 cents in a dollar tax bracket, you know, was one of the real pieces of reform by the former government, by the Morrison government. Now, it was the incentive for people, you know, to work harder, to earn more, between 45000 and the best part of $200,000. That was genuine reform. This also, almost to me, seems regressive, not progressive tax policy. So the progressiveness of our tax system is a really important feature of it, um, but I am actually supportive of, of keeping that 37% tax bracket um, because it was really a big leap when we look at the original stage three tax cut reforms between the tax brackets and probably a bit too big. But we do need to have a conversation around bracket creep, around what the appropriate tax settings are and how we should be looking at those going forward rather than having these kind of one-off discussions about particular aspects. OK, I agree with that, but then there's no government. This is, as I've said, a political risk for the government. It's a broken promise, there is no doubt. But the question is whether the, the numbers, whether they feel as though the top end, those on $145,000 a year or more than net taxpayers, as it were, um, there's a smaller number of them than the larger proportion of people who are, you know, net not taxpayers, uh, and effectively they're the ones who really probably hold the balance of power in terms of the voting for the government. Look, we know that Australians on lower incomes are really doing it toughest with the cost of living pressures at the moment, particularly those that are renting um, and don't have as many resources. And we do think there is some scope for cost of living relief here. I would prefer to see that through something like a really targeted reform, like an increase in Commonwealth rent assistance, rather than a, a tax cut. Um, but there is an argument for some support for those households that are very much struggling, and we see that throughout the community. OK, but isn't it also true, and we've seen this in the past, that once a tax cut is handed out, it's baked into the system. You can't actually take it away. As you point out, one-off levies, one-off support payments, they would help people and also means that the government is not permanently committed to them if circumstances change in the future. Yes, if we're looking at cost of living relief, we would like to see more targeted, time-limited payments than looking at these tax um, cuts, um, in the, looking at tax cuts just as a one-off. Um, so we'd like to see some targeted support around cost of living and then a broader, um, more detailed conversation around tax settings. There's one final bit for you, and that is the reason why most Australian families are surviving right now is because the unemployment is so low. Does this actually change the balance in regards to employability and indeed Australia's competitiveness into the future? Look, I don't think that the tax situation is having a huge impact on employment at the moment. We do need to be aware that unemployment is starting to, to look like it's going to tick up a little bit, um, although it does remain relatively low. But we're seeing the impacts of interest rates starting to bite. We're seeing those impacts on consumer spending, and that is likely to lead to unemployment rising a little bit. So we do need to be really conscious of cost of living pressures, particularly on those lower income households, and if we see some change in the employment situation. I'll tell you what, Cassandra Windsor, always good to chat to you, and many thanks for your time today. Thank you, Russ.